episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I am Zipper 2. Joining me today is Milan Jeptic 1992 and Steve Baxi. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hi. Uh, gentlemen, what are we discussing today? Uh, oh, I thought Milan was going to go. Um, okay, um, I'll answer that. Oh, fuck that. that. I... Yeah. So who's going? Okay. Yeah. This, this week, um, we are continuing to celebrate Horror Movie Month here on Geeky Gentlemen. And these two fucks don't know what the hell they're doing. We're continuing to celebrate Horror Movie Month here on Geeky Gentlemen, and we are continuing Horror Movie Month by watching the 1986 film The Fly. Hooray oh, and stuff! Yeah. There should be a sound effect there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I just hummed the. Okay, fucking... John Williams. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that's right. Just um, anyway. Oh, the fly. Jurassic Park thing, yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right, so... um, Not as I shocking said, as I thought it would be. Shut up. As I said last week when I was introducing this, I had a feeling mm-hmm. when we did horror mov- when we started out on Horror Movie Month that Milan was going to pick something just completely insane, and he did. Yes, he did. And that Steve was going to pick something that we could intellectually debate about, and he did. We did. And I wanted to go for the middle ground, so I picked something that was batshit crazy to watch, but also really fucking deep. So I picked The Fly with Jeff Goldblum. And I mm. really fucking love this movie. This is such a good movie, but it's so hard to watch. <laughs> um, but in a good way. Why? Yeah, th- there's Why moments of it because it's such a psychological horror thing. Of if you're watching it continuously, no matter how many times you've seen the scene, it it still feels kind of terrifying. I mean, there's Ugh. that, and then there's just the fucking gross factor of you know he vomits on shit, and like that's hard to watch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like I was watching this with Haley, and I told I warned her that it was gonna be gross. And then when the the first like gross out scene happens with the baboon but that's short enough and it doesn't linger on it very long so she got over that but then there's the first big gross out scene when he's arm wrestling and oh my god Ooh, yeah <laughs> oh. and then just the progressive eroding of his face and everything mm-hmm. uh, it's such a white bread movie I mean holy shit I mean it's so <laughs> bland and just, like I see this movie I'm like I was expecting to be shocked, but instead I was just like, eh, a man turns into a fly. I, uh, I've this seen happens all the trans- time in Soviet Russia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck off. We haven't been Soviet for, like, fucking decades now. God damn you and your Soviet You haven't jokes. been up front, Stop Soviet. it. Get his- no. You have your president is in Russian ETB. Russian- yeah, I was going to say this. Your president, we're not, the man who runs we're not your country. We're not Soviet, dude. Is We're the Holy King. Russian Am- Shut up, dude! We're the Holy Russian Empire, God damn it! And we have our Tsar. I don't think like hundred years know. at this point. Well, anyway. fuck. Huh. We're getting there, you know. One country at a time. You know, praise, <laughs> uh, praise Tsar, you know, Putin the first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, um, yeah. so, well, what are your first actual of his thoughts? line? Um, it was good. I, I like the fact that it was um, actually intelligent horror. Like, when I heard David Lynch, I kept expecting crappy cheese. 
um, because you know we they live is is a fun movie, but it's just like popcorn. They fun. live. It had the weird gross. David Lynch. I who cares? Who gives a fuck? Anyway, but like I was I wasn't expecting this level of fucking uh, intelligence really. I was expecting a fun 80s gross out best, but in reality, I got a rather clever character study with genuine characters that act like human beings in a realistic location, uh, somewhere damp, you know, and, and filled with poor people. And uh, Jeff Goldblum is just a delightful motherfucker. He, he's not the nerd, quote unquote. He's an actual adult. Shut up, up. He's an actual adult who has charm. And, like, he is adorable. Like I've never got that before, but he's he's an adorable guy. I can see like like yeah yeah definitely. But he's a fish person, which is odd. You got a big googly eyed Lovecraftian Innsmouth fish person turning into a fly. So yeah, of course there's a lot of Love, you know very Lovecraftian themes in this movie. You know kind of it, what really reminds this is really kind of um. This kind of reminds me of Colors Out of Space in a way. The kind of the degeneration of the body over time. Yeah. Uh, yes, what? Drugam, Papa. Okay, anyway, Sorry. Basically he says that he wants to have I can't right now. God damn it. Go away, Papa. Anyway, sorry about that. I'll just get rid of him. Just Where's my hammer? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it is. I, I can see that comparison to to Lovecraft because it does have that that character kind of not writing everything down but documenting everything that's happening to him. Um, just because that's the only way he can possibly hold on to any sanity. And like, I'm sure in my my favorite scene, um, <laughs> when he starts. Filming the Brundlefly um, documentary <laughs> for children. Um, I'm sure Milan wants to make the joke. Oh, I remember that documentary from when I was a child. Um, Funny I enough, there was a guy. Day. Yeah. Funny enough, the there National was this Museum weird deformed guy. Yeah, yeah. Dude, we get to see, like, dude. He, like, it's so weird because it's, it's so fucked up. Because like he pa you pan into the pantry and you see like his. You like his liver or just little bits of organs, but they they look phallic enough uh, to like holy shit he's cock and balls dropped off, mm -hmm. and because he like he walks around naked and he's and he's essentially a Munich now, and that's fucked up. All the like subtle implications of of this whole transformation is just gorgeous, like just yeah. beautiful and it's uh, yeah in, in its execution. I mean, like this is amazing. Like the, film, the cinematography and just the storytelling in this, I mean, like, you'd never have something of this class today, because today it's all gonna be, like, fucking CGI polish. But here, oh. it's actual fuck it. Oh, no, really. A CGI polish, you know, the fly would be a CGI character and if this movie was to be remade today. In reality, they don't go overboard with the uh, prosthetics. They don't overuse them, you know, to the point where they lose their punch. I mean, they use them just enough to just punctuate the story points, you know? They use them for a reason. They don't just like, look at what my FX team can do! Of course, there's an element of that, but that, you know, yeah, the, like the, the director, really yeah. Bad rap because of people like fucking Michael Bay that just overuse it, but when you use CGI well for effects, it does look good just to oh, justify definitely. it. Yeah. I don't know, I just get really yeah, annoyed but, when everyone's go-to is, oh, they just overuse CGI. I'm like... That doesn't. Well, the thing they is, just use CGI to do this. That doesn't mean it'd be awful. Um, well, I'm not. I'm not talking shit like about Pacific Rim yeah. or Hellboy, where you've got a really good set design going with the CGI. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's just shit like that. I'm like, really? Come on now. Just everyone shits on CGI for no reason because fucking Michael Bay uses it. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. I just the, the prosthetics though are absolutely jaw-dropping so fucked up and oh man it, it it really fucking bugs me to see sometimes <laughs> like no lie when when his ear falls off that's just too much um 
Um, that and the, the one that sticks with me, I was telling Steve about this the uh, the other night after Milan got off, but um, the scene that sticks with me from this movie the most is the fucking abortion dream sequence. Yeah. That one just... Oh, man. Like, I think what's... What, I, I've really been thinking about that scene over the last couple of weeks, and what I've come to the conclusion of, and I'm going to get to my conclusion in a second here, but um, I think it's so successful because of what it exactly gets blending in what it's showing. And what I mean by that is American films have a lot of violence but very little sex in comparison. Like, they, they have nudity, they have sex scenes and all that stuff, but they don't have as much of it, or it's not as it's not as in your face as the violence and the gore is. And conversely, European films have a lot of sex that's really apparent, really a big part of the story, and you see a lot of it, but they don't have very much violence or gore. And I think that the fly in general, but the abortion scene in particular mixes those two as upfront and in your face in just such a really shocking way that it's, it's very impressive because it takes both extremes of how uncomfortable both those um, styles of horror or styles of whatever filmmaking can be and it puts it on screen at the same time. And it's just really fucked. And it helps that it, this is a movie that's really building towards its end. So you establish early on that between these two protagonists, it's a physical relationship. They don't hide the fact they don't use sex scenes just for the hell of it. The fact that you know that these two are very physical with each other, and this is a very physical thing for both parties, and it culminating, in a sense, with an abortion scene, the emotional weight's there, along with just simply how well-directed, how well-put-together that particular scene is. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it just... Wow, and when that larva comes out... Uh, I mean, honestly, yeah. you, you could cut that scene and just take it on tour and give it to the pro-life people, and it'll be the best propaganda that they could ever have. <laughs> um, that that scene is very good for creating a pit in anyone's stomach, I would imagine. Yeah. Oh my god, it's just so graphic and it's so disturbing and honestly the larva is only on screen for like two seconds yeah and then it's over but there's just so much going on behind that yeah it's just that one just sticks with me every time uh, and i mean to be honest have you ever seen an abortion on screen before like i i don't th that's a place no one ever goes to and here they did it and it's not just for shock value it is a huge story point, but it's also very obviously shocking as hell to see. Yeah, um, it, it's not abortion and childbirth just for the sake of it. Like, there's an idea behind it, and I, I don't want it to sound like all fartsy fartsy, but w when you see that worm thing just come out of her, it's an idea as much as it is it's a, a scary visual and just the idea of something like that could be inside of you as a consequence of what happened and who you are with all of that really works together and this is kind of like a Dave, david cronenberg staple of the fact that the psychological is all there which is what makes the physical representations of it so scary or so disgusting it's that your mind already built up an idea of where you're supposed to be in this particular scene Mhm. Mm yeah definitely it's just it's it is, to me, the most effective scene in the entire movie, and I think it's telling that there's not much movie after that. Um, the the close second, for me at least, is... And it's... The, the only reason I can't put this first is because it sticks with me, but not as much as the abortion scene. When Jeff Goldblum's talking about insect politics, oh, which is yeah. one of the greatest like monologue-slash-dialogue moments ever in horror... Um, I, I think it's the greatest in Jeff Goldblum's entire career, to be fair, I haven't Definitely. seen all of Jeff movies, um, but when he talks about insect politics, oh my god, it's so, it's so heartbreaking, it's like every, the thing is, it's such a trope of monster movies, like, it's not an uncommon thing for there to be a guy that's turned into a monster, and for him to tell the woman that he loves, no, go away, that's, that's not an uncommon thing, but 
God, the way Goldblum plays it, it's just incredible. Yeah. He yeah, just sells there's a lot of scenes. Yeah, in a weird way, this is kind of like, I hate to use this pretentious fucking term, but there's a lot of magical realism in it, or more horrific realism, because there's a lot of realistic, you know, really kind of... There's a sense of genuine realism in this film. People act and talk like genuine humans, and even the evil boyfriend, quote-unquote, isn't the evil boyfriend. Like, the relationship he has with the lady is a real relationship, and sure, he acts out a little bit, but not in a mean-spirited way. People act like humans in this film, and that kind of genuine, uh, realistic, real-world sensibility contrasts with the more grotesque elements of, you know, Mr. David Lynch's uh, fetish for flesh. <laughs> yeah! Yeah, I think so, and uh, like, I think why I like that scene so much is because it's the last time you see the character from the beginning of the movie. Yeah. After that, he has completely lost his mind, and he's... It's not the fly that's taking over like he would like to think. It's just that he has isolated himself, and he just knows what's coming, so it, he's just so, like, gone by that point. Um, But that's the last time you see... You know, Seth Brundle or whatever his name. What's his first name? Seth. Okay. Uh, yeah, it is. Seth. For some reason, that seemed wrong. Um, yeah, it's the last time you see Seth Brundle, and he is a character that, you know, you don't realize it, but you really fall in love with him um, throughout the movie up Definitely. until he teleports himself. Like he's just such a lovable it's guy. It's like so. He's he's Definitely. not suave. He's not charismatic, but he's just. I, I I hate to agree with Milan just on principle, but he is adorable. <laughs> yeah, he's a cute yeah. motherfucker. The girl even says it. I mean, he, he's a cute motherfucker. Like, genuinely cute. Not the kawaii cute, but just like, you're a cute motherfucker type of cute. Yeah, this I, is the Spider-Man movie where everything goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> more perfect summary than that. <laughs> no, really, it is the Spider-Man movie where everything goes wrong. This is fantastic. Oh um, my god, really funny. <laughs> but a part of what makes him quote-unquote adorable is that he's a really relatable person. He, he believes he's found the way to make everyone stronger, everyone faster, everyone more pure. And it backfires, and he really wishes he could relate to someone, and that desperation and part of that fly nature is what ultimately gets to him. Um, and it, it's really tragic. I'm surprised um, we haven't mentioned it to this point, but the, the last scene in the film is really, really good, um, where she finally kills him. And yeah. it, it looks almost as if he's sort of begging for it at that point. Well, he puts the gun well, to his course. head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like, he's fucking fused with bits of the machine. I like that little detail. Like, when he, like, he rips the door off when he's trying to get at her, and the bit of that metal, you know, gets, gets re, uh, teleported with him. Uh, and, like, when he get, shut the fuck up! Basically, when he try, when he crawls out of the other teleporter, he has fucking bits of metal stuck into him. He's essentially a giant half-metal, half-man fly monstrosity at that point. You know, look, all these atoms are completely fucking re, you know, rejambled. So of course he's gonna beg for death. He must be in intense fucking physical pain. Because he's fucking cable. No, not because he's fucking cable, Mickey. Cable is a badass. Not this is the fly. Uh. The fly is adorable. <laughs> when he was human. I would not use the word the adorable to associate with Brendel Fly whatsoever. Uh, whatsoever. Agreed. Agreed. I don't <laughs> even want to think about hugging him. <laughs> See, it's it's really funny. Um, a while for a while now, Haley's had this joke that she'll tell every so often, where she'll use a little bit of science. And for those that don't know, every time a fly lands, it vomits. So if a fly ever lands on you, you have vomit on you. Um, so like a joke that she'll say is, "Yeah, so how'd you like to go on a date with a fly? It's just, mm, this looks good." Blech! And then there's that scene where he first grabs the donut while um, Ronnie's around and vomits on the donut in front of her and she wasn't expecting it at all and Haley wasn't expecting it at all 
<laughs> so she's just like, ah, oh, and she like hides under a blanket. <laughs> um, what's his name? That that evil really boyfriend guy. When he with... finally gets the tape and realizes that vomiting is how he eats, and his reaction is just perfect. Oh my god. Like, because you don't even need to see it at that point. The guy's just watching. He just, like, turns away. Oh, man. <sighs> this is a good movie to watch with someone because it has a lot of dark humor in it. Um, like, when Goldblum throws up that first time when his e after his ear falls off, um, it's disgusting, but it's also meant to be kind of funny. Because <laughs> um, he goes, oh, that's she... Dude, his ear fucking fall. This is the second film in a row when a fucking person's ear comically falls off. Well, not in a row, but yes. Um, yeah, I mean, but anyway, uh, like it's so f that his ear falls off, and then fucking like she hugs him, she puts her head on the womb where his ear used to be. I'm like, Ew. dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? Don't hug him. Like <laughs> that, that's unsanitary, bitch. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, just just, just thought of the throwing AIDS. in a... Yeah, I suppose so, but then AIDS came along. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's the thing about life before the 80s. Everyone was just fucking bleeding on each other all the time. It was no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, Needless to say, it was a very disgusting time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anal cunnilingus was like, just like, this is how people shook, shook hands back in the fucking 80s. They just lick each other's assholes and shit in each other's mouths for a little bit, you know? And now then, like, God looked at that and said, Nuh-uh, here's some AIDS. And then people died and got wise. Um, I, can I, I like that we jokes. mentioned that I a little bit. Um, because there's a lot of people who... And David Cronenberg doesn't think that this is part of the film, but people are using, or were at the time, were using this as kind of an allegory for AIDS at the time. Oh, God, no. Yeah. I, a terrible allegory for AIDS. It is. And he's, David Cronenberg even gone out and said that that's not what he intended in the slightest, but there's a lot of people yeah. analyzing it from that perspective. Yeah, well, those people are fucking retards, because apparently if you fuck a man, you'll turn into a hideous fly monster, kids. Don't do that. <laughs> I'm just trying to see where the argument is. Is it just that he had sex and... Turn I don't get it. Like, I, ju I just can't see that, because he doesn't get it from having sex. Um, I guess she almost dies from the having sex, but... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like, he gets it from spitting face. in the face of God. Yeah, definitely. He gets... Well, see, he turns like, into that a actually, fly... He, that yeah, actually, well, let me just get this thing out. Oh, he, sure. He gets this... His ho yeah, he gets this horrible disease because he spits in the face of God, and that's bad. Like, and, but really, it doesn't have that kind of, you know, Jurassic Park science is evil. It's just like, dude, you know, just be careful. You know, he invented something glorious, but he, the thing is, he did it in his fucking basement. Like, if you don't no, no, have no, proper... Let me get in, let me get in here, because I know the perfect thing to say to this, all right? This is not a movie about science going too far. This is a movie, the whole moral of this movie is don't make decisions when you're drunk. Um, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. I mean, yeah, and like, yeah. it's, dude, look, if you're making a teleporter device, don't you need an actual lab with qualified professionals, not just you, some random dude in, in the ghetto? You know? What's wrong with you, dude? In the ghetto? I live in the ghetto. There's no white people here. It's amazing. You know? There's I mean, just I brown and... I guess I see where you're coming from, but, like, they do kind of mention it briefly. It is it is damn near a throwaway line to just explain why Jeff Goldblum's character isn't a super genius. But um, he mentions that he's just piecing it together, getting, like, one guy to build this part, one guy to get this part, and he's like, knows how it'll all work together, but he doesn't know how to do every single part of it. And he, the company that funds him is funding it, but he's doing it cheap enough that they don't care yet. So he doesn't want the fame attached to it, or he doesn't want, like, the the attention that it will draw to distract him from what he's working on. Yeah, um, and you know is, what? Is, at first I thought, 
Yeah, yeah. The, at first, I thought it was gonna. He was worried that you know, if he, you know, he if if he can like teleport like inanimate objects, people will just go, oh, we can do that, and some great big old company, like the company from RoboCop, would just see that and said, oh, that's good enough. We can teleport people. Like, but no, no, no like I need to fix some other things. Nope, it's good enough. So <laughs> if you have this great invention, and if some co corporation get their claws into it, at that point, they could do the whole 80s thing of, like, corporations don't give a fuck about safety. You know? Mm-hmm. But it, it's interesting. I, I if you, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, but it's interesting. They had this, a, uh, yeah. You mentioned this while it's still relevant. I was watching a review of the sequel, which, I mean, when you hear that they made a sequel to this, the first thought is, that sounds terrible. <laughs> And to be fair, I don't know yet. Uh, I do plan on watching it because, from what I heard, the general consensus was it's not as good, but it's not awful. Um, so, in the sequel, the company that he worked for actually got a hold of Ronnie, and she never got to get the abortion. So they have Brendel's son, who, and they have his teleportation machine, and they have all the tapes that he made and stuff. So that's the that's kind of the premise of the second movie what you're just talking about. So that's interesting. What happens in that film? Um, his son is like ha has like the whole fly thing going for him too, and he like grows at an accelerated rate. So when he's five years old, he looks eighteen, um, and he's super intelligent and all this stuff. And the company's trying to figure out how to get the um the teleportation machine to work on people and they can't do it and they deform a dog and, and shit like that and then uh, the sun starts to turn into the fly and yada yada. So yeah. Mm. It's it, it. it looks interesting. I'm going to I'm going to watch it. Um I don't want to spoil the end of a movie we're not reviewing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because you know, if we spoil a movie that we're not watching, or not none of us have watched, I'm assuming. Well, like, you know, the, my hope like, would be yeah. that that someone might watch this, not know that there was a sequel, like I did, and then maybe they're gonna want to go watch the sequel. So, I suppose so. Maybe not. Um, because I'd never heard of a sequel to that this movie. I, I had no idea it existed. Yeah, because the ending is kind of perfect for what they were doing, so a sequel just feels unnatural at that point. Yeah, but I mean, from Definitely. what I can tell, it, it made a lot of sense. That being said, I did have this one nitpick when I found out how they like set up the sequel. So they have Ronnie have the baby, and like it, you could make an argument that she appears to be forced to in that movie, and that's all well and good, but I'm like, well, you had the damn ho crazy slut hooker bitch from the bar. Why didn't you use her? You know? It, it just seems like a really crazy? silly thing. Yeah, it's true. Why is she, why is she crazy? Because she went home with a guy after he bet on her in an arm wrestling match. <laughs> oh. And she saw him okay. rip that guy's hand. Yeah. And she oh. just thinks well, that's really cool. That's just well, it, it is pretty cool. I would have gone back with Jeff Goldblum. Well, and we all know the, that Bond is the best decisions. <laughs> um, oh, totally. Like, I am really rational and completely, you know, just... Of course. It's go Jeff Goldblum. He has, like, he has an Oscar, doesn't he? Something like that, I'm sure. I believe he does, yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, yeah, there we go. So, fuck you. Even if he does turn into a hideous fly monster... You know, you, a good man like that is not a thing to throw away. <laughs> <laughs> Milan, I want you to do a video on your channel where you sing a karaoke version of Stand By Your Man. Um, but I want you to do it after making a, a perfect screen accurate... Um, uh, per, uh, what's the word I want? Um, a, a perfect screen accurate life size puppet of the fly monster, and I want you to sing it to the fly monster. <laughs> Stand by your man. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, I already Do it. have. A Do it now. I already have. I already have a replica of the Prosthetic. fly monster. That's what I want. That's, you know, he's actually rather gooey. 
you know? <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's, 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 it's delightful. Anyway, um, yeah, this is, it, it just, how do they do that whole part with him cleaning, like, climbing on the walls? Do they have, like, a rotating room or something? No, I think it was just Spider-Man style, just the way you shoot it. Hmm. Like, you know that famous scene in Spider-Man where Peter Parker climbs up the wall for the first time? I, I seriously mm-hmm. think that's how they did it. Just clever camera work. It Damn. looks really looks... good, though. Yep. Yeah, like, I think what helps, that, what helps sell that so well um, is it's, it's not weird. like in Spider-Man where it's just a wall that he's climbing up. And it's weird because Spider-Man came out, like, what, 20 years after this movie? Um, it's that there's, like, shelves with stuff on them, but there's, like, they're all disorganized, and they have, like, shit falling out of them. Like, you know, it's like, the, there's, like, a box of, like, wet wipes, and there's just a wipe hanging out of it, but it's hanging out in such a way that it still looks like it's vertically oriented on a shelf, not like it's against a wall, uh, like, against the ground. So there's yeah. a lot of stuff like that that I think really helps sell that effect. Um, oh, definitely. And I love the fact he, the way he just talks about it, it's like, oh my god. And he's just like, hey, what's this? And he pulls up his shirt, and that weird fucking thing is sticking out of him. Like, what's this? I don't know. <laughs> and he's just, he's just so cavalier about everything. Fucking <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. He says, what's this? I don't know. <laughs> he just, oh, I love that guy. Jeff. Uh, <laughs> exactly what he's like too you're right um like it, it's so weird he goes through such a like because what the first 40 minutes of this movie there's hardly a scene without Jeff Goldblum and then the next like and then once he starts turning into the monster you just see him periodically right like you see him yeah. whenever Ronnie sees him basically yeah you kind of shift perspective at that point yeah, and what's really interesting about it is you just get to see how he's going crazy. Because the first time she sees him, and he says it's been like four months or something when he's when his ear falls off, he is ready to die. He's still Seth Brundle. He's still the same guy. He just knows he fucked up and that he's falling apart, and he's okay with that. Because he says, I think it's manifesting as a cancer, and it's just tearing me apart. I'm like... But I don't want to, you know, leech off of people or anything like that. I'm going to die with dignity <laughs> in my apartment, vomiting on donuts. Um, <laughs> and so what does like, he say? Like, what does what was his like argument for not going to a hospital? Because he didn't want to be a charity case, and he didn't want the world to know what had happened to him, because then it would mean his invention would never um, get out. Is is I think the gist huh. of what he was going for. But anyway... Then um, why the fuck does he record it all? If he doesn't want, like, his invention... Because he wanted it to be a success and presented it that way. He didn't want it to be associated with some kind of tragedy. Yeah, let me get to that, though. So then, the second time you see him, when he's doing the fucking wall crawler thing, and like you said, this is just the Spider-Man movie where everything goes wrong. Um, (laughs) You know, that's what they should do for the next Amazing Spider-Man, is the... um, the, what do you call that? Where Peter Parker turns into a human-sized spider? Um, uh, what's the name for that? <laughs> I have but, like, oh I yeah, fucking Andrew. Go- oh yeah, well Andrew Garfield. Anyway, anyway, let me let me get back to what I was saying. But, no, no, no. Yeah, but, let me, but, but, let me Andrew get back Garfield. To what I was would, before you do, before you move, move, before we move on from this point, like I would love to see Andrew Garfield with like two extra hands because he's such really expressive hands. You know, that'd mm. be great. I'm not sure I would do it, but it'd be cool to see. Anyway, um, so oh, like, there's then there's the next time we see uh, Brundle, and he's like, you know, crawling on the walls, and you can tell that the isolation and the fact that he knows what's coming has just shocked the hell out of him. And he's just trying so hard to hold on to. I'm a scientist. I must, you know, I must do the things scientists do and document it all. But he's going crazy because he's like, oh, I'll show this to children. I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, this is awful. You know it is. <laughs> um, I think he was just joking with the whole children thing, like kind of sar- sardonic humor. He wasn't serious, was he? No, I think the character damn near meant it because he'd just gone that fucking off the rails. I think it was just kind of a I joke. Think the, I'm going to show this to kids. Fun. No, I think it was funny because it's like meant to be funny from our perspective, but I don't think the character thought it was funny. Oh. See, See, what are you so that brings up a bit of an interesting point because you mentioned earlier that we get 
half of this movie entirely from Jeff Goldblum's perspective, and then we shift and we see him slowly going crazy. I wonder if, taking that joke into perspective, if maybe he's just crazy all the way through, and it's really of a matter of we got to see him rationalize it early on, and we didn't later. And if we perhaps had 40 minutes later of him in transformation, he, we wouldn't think he's as crazy as we do now. Maybe. Because, I uh, mean, that, that think, joke like, certainly sounds crazy, but I mean, if we had two minutes before or two minutes after it, it might even fit together. Because this is also the guy that just brings a reporter randomly over to his house because he invented teleportation. And he thinks it's a perfectly rational idea to send a baboon through it and then send himself through it while he's drunk. Like, you can't be all there even in the beginning. Well, to well, be he's fair, a like, he scientist. wasn't planning to send the... He, to be fair, he wasn't planning to send the baboon through and then go in himself five minutes later like he did. No, that but was just the fact that he was able to rationalize it at that point even if he wasn't planning on it. I got well, you. He was okay. drunk. Yeah, but still, the, the fact he makes decisions and off that and those yeah, things people like People make that. the best decisions when they're drunk, <laughs> don't they? Oh, of course they do. That's how Russia managed to stay so strong for so long. <laughs> oh, yeah. With your fucking crumbling economy and your goddamn fucking Hitler Jr. Um, <laughs> oh, come on. Uh, it's, he's not Hitler. He's fucking, you know, he's a, he's a Why aren't he's, a, he... ready, he's ready for gay people to start having to wear pink triangles. Um, anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I suppose you're right. The whole pink triangles are quite fashionable in Russia. Well, actually, it's I'm I'm fairly impressed with the uh, the I guess I'll call it the homosexual movement where um, the pink triangle was adopted. I was I was really impressed by that that turn. I like the pink triangle significantly more than I like the rainbow flag. I think the rainbow flag is Definitely. stupid, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> yeah, because like some of those colors represent magic, don't you know? Fucking seventies. Well, no, bro. I just think the rainbow flag Fuck. looks like looks so like I think the rainbow flag would be something that someone that doesn't understand gay people would like choose to refuse, represent gay people with um it's like it's like Definitely. a white guy designing the black power fist instead of a black guy um I don't <laughs> know it just it doesn't seem to work for me anyway 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 back back to the fly I don't know Steve I, I guess I see what you're saying but with with the scene in particular do you think that the character meant it as a joke, or do you think it's, like, him just being nuts? I think it, at that point it is just him being nuts. Um, okay. And again, I, I believe that the fact that he is nuts just comes from what perspective we're seeing him through. Mm -hmm. um, unless you had somewhere else you wanted to go, I do want to bring up another area we could talk about here. Go for it. Um, do you think this is a science fiction movie first and a horror movie later? I think it's Definitely. a perfect blend of both. Okay, because um, the reason I say that is it, it doesn't follow necessarily the, the 80s horror movie format of like doing something scary to set it up and then just kind of doing something thrilling every few minutes in. It's, it's really slow building, and it's mm -hmm. about the fact that this guy made something first and the ideas that represents and the kind of person that's associated with the technology before it does anything to actually frighten us. I guess I'd see that point. So if you mean, like, uh, when you said first, I was more thinking just in principle. Yeah, that's but sort of But the I way mean. you're talking about it, no, the way you're talking about it seems more in just, like, actual way that the movie is paced. And if if you're talking about it in just the way that the movie is paced, I'd agree. But in principle, what the movie is trying to do is horrify you. And what the movie needs to do to horrify you truly is to make you fall in love with the guy, which is why they don't have a scare jump thing every five minutes or whatever and why they take their time Definitely. To but I think still in principle there's clearly a lot of science fiction ideas and um, concepts that they want to bring to the fold even before they want to get to the fact that they want to terrify you with the fly and make you fall in love with the guy Definitely. I guess. The thing with that, but... this is this is what most horror is. This is what separates uh, pop culture horror. I mean, popcorn horror from like genuine like artistic horror. Yeah. Like in popcorn horror, it's just essentially a giant meat mincing machine in human form. It's just like, hey, look at these fucking stupid kids. Let's kill them. 
well, maybe we can make you like him a little bit, but not really. He's just there to see the violence and the gore and cheer along with the villain. But with genuine horror, with intellectual horror, it's mostly like it's more of a Lovecraftian thing. It's or it's more it's mostly a Stephen King thing, really. They've kind of blended the ideas of Stephen King and uh, Lovecraft. With Lovecraft, you got you got the otherness, the weird otherworldly force that changes the human body and transforms you into something other than what you are. But with Stephen King, he brings that kind of character love to the mix. You, you give a shit about the character. Thus, the horror aspects really do have a genuine emotional punch to them. Because if you give a fuck about a character, you know, like the horror that you see them go through means something. You know, and that's why we're not scared of Jeff Goldblum. We're kind of, well, at least I'm scared of him because I relate to him. I'm. I'm sad for him because it's you see this person who you generally grown to love over the film transform into something that's not him you you see him transform into something grotesque and hideous and sick and not the person that he, that you fell in love with it's that kind of subversion of, of feelings uh that you know real genuine intellectual horror brings to the table that i really appreciate and I, I think in that mixture that you brought up um hitchcock's definitely important to add because Things like Psycho do this all the time, too, where oh, definitely. you've got, like, half the movie is one yeah. very specific thing in order to set up the intellectual horror that becomes the second half. And I guess it's that why, that's Completely why I would great. say yeah. that it's not necessarily a science fiction movie first, because I've seen other horror movies that don't, like, set up a bunch of skaters right out the gate and do take their time to get to anything horrifying. And that's why, like... Just because this movie happens to take that time to also set up the science fiction element that the rest of the horror is based on, I don't. I guess I don't see why it'd be a science fiction movie first in principle. Well, maybe even it's part of it sure. is still that the ideas in this film aren't traditional horror genre ideas. It, it it's definitely got that aspect of we fear the ugly and we and we need the ugly to understand the beautiful, and it, it's got that there. But I think the commentary it's making is, is still more along the lines of what most science fiction would do about kind of the nature of machines mixed with the imperfection of humanity and what that ultimately turns you into and how you can live with how you live with certain inventions and how those inv those inventions will reflect on other people and the world and how your own understanding is based on how you think people would handle technology. I agree. And actually, let me just say one thing. This movie has a line that has influenced my understanding of technology better than any, like, more so than anything else I can think of, any other paper in philosophy I've ever read about thinking machines and all that shit. And I realize, you know, Asterix, this movie's from 1987, we have the Eureka machine and all that shit now, but I still think this applies very much so. You ready? Sure. The line that gets me that I always go back to is computers are dumb, they only know what you tell them. And <laughs> it's a throwaway line, it's just a little way to get a little pro plot contrivance out of the way, but for some reason that has really influenced my thinking when it comes to technology. Um, and that it's great, it can do a lot of really cool things, but you gotta remember it's just an extension of what a person is able to do. Yeah, and what I, that goes hand in hand with another computer phrase, which is computer to yeah. the world's smartest idiots. <laughs> Definitely. It basically, that's you know that's why people always say, oh, computers are gonna take over the world, this and that. No, computers are fucking tools, you buffoon. They're well, not I mean, this Blade scary Runner. cybernetic monstrosity. Well, fuck, brain. Yeah, shut up. Well, I, 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 I mean, I'm not, I'm my, not my saying you're pointing about. I, I just mean the fact that there is some legitimacy to the set, the fear of sentient computers. Of course, of course. You know, it's all. Everybody knows that the cybernetic apocalypse is coming, and we we can't stop it. I've tried. You know, just <laughs> you know. Oh, you know how you stop the cybernetic apocalypse? You start a zombie apocalypse before, <laughs> so the robot soldiers have to fight the zombies. <laughs> well, the thing is, you've got like, evil Terminator at that point. Mm. <laughs> the thing is, I tried that. Get that turned down in the background. Sorry, Mickey. He said no. Anyway. He's being a cunt. Are you ever going to move out? <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I think the way you stop a robot apocalypse is you start a zombie apocalypse. And I think the way you stop a zombie apocalypse is you start a robot apocalypse. This makes perfect sense to me. My, my question would be, how do you have the means to start a robot apocalypse during the midst of a zombie apocalypse? Or well, would you start you the robot one that. first before the zombie one took off? Well, you have a failsafe intact that Skynet activates if there's ever a zombie apocalypse. Oh, ah, okay. That's that's my. But point. that makes it completely rational at that point. I, here's my question: <laughs> You know, why the fuck does no one ever light zombies on fire? Would yeah, that, it seems like the easiest idea ever because definitely. then they can't come after you. Definitely. Well, you isn't know what's the problem weird? with that that it takes too long sometimes? No, not yeah, really. A flamethrower. Yeah, but like you know what's interesting? This should be a story or a movie where every single apocalypse you can imagine happens at the same time. So fucking Ragnarok. Wasn't that this is the end? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. I'm serious. Like every single apocalypse ever. Zombie apocalypse. Fucking Christian apocalypse. Ragnarok. Fucking. Like, a robot apocalypse. Every apocalypse you can possibly... Cthulhu just shows up. Yeah. Oh, I'm late, guys. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, fucking the, the Hindu apocalypse. Everything goes down. Cthulhu Dark comes side from the finds sea. his anti-life equation and everything. Fuck yeah, everything. Everything <laughs> happens at once, and you basically have a giant clusterfuck of apocalyptic forces fighting for control over the Earth. And Sounds everyone like a else bad just... season of Supernatural. No, fuck yeah. Everything just, everyone just sits back and watches this all shit go down. You know, you have Jesus and Hind and fucking, you know, Krishna sitting there eating po uh, eating fucking popcorn with the rest of the saved humans, like looking at this shit go down. Like, look at that. It's fucking Thor beating up Krishna. I do like it when Thor fights other deities. Um, yeah, there we go. Hmm. Uh, okay, um, back to the movie, I suppose. Yes. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Milan. You're welcome. You always know just have to get us how to get us off topic. That's um, my job, you know. I'm the fun guy that that, that 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 says things. I'm not a fat guy, Mickey. <laughs> anyway, um. So what were we talking about? The got us on the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> um, we, we were talking about the machinist ideas in the movie. Okay, yeah, I, I I do really like the um the way that the computer is characterized in this though is yeah. it does what a computer uh, like honestly I have no problem seeing a computer just inventing that as a solution. It's like, well, I've got these two things, I guess I'll just combine them. Here's the problem though, and this is kind of a plot hole, but there's an argument out of it that I'm going to give, and I normally don't do that, but I like this movie so much that I'm going to. Fair enough. All right, so. You'll remember that he is unable to send living organisms. It's a major plot point in the movie. And he has the whole revelation, the way that Ronnie says the flesh, he gives this whole revelation about the computer not realizing that it has to send actual flesh, not its interpretation of flesh, right? Yeah. Um, so, the way he does his little experiment to prove his theory correctly is he cuts a steak in two pieces then sends one through the teleporter and then grills them both up and has Ronnie eat them. Um, he puts the steak that he puts in the teleporter on a plate. And when it comes out, he's got a steak and a plate. He doesn't have steak plate. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. So it's a major fucking plot hole. Well, see, I was thinking <laughs> of a different plot hole when you mentioned this. Okay, well, you can take yours in a second, but yeah. I'm going to give my justification. Yeah, go ahead. So the computer at the time that he was sending the steak and the plate through was sending its interpretation, but then when he told it how to read flesh and how to understand flesh and, and biology, then it, um, it didn't realize that it was supposed to put its interpretation of two different things through. It put its interpretation of flesh and just saw it all as one thing. Um, and that's why it put it together. That's the best explanation I can come up with if it makes any sense whatsoever. You know, if this thing went into, if this teleporter device went into mass production, you essentially, you, you'd get the whole fucking uh, splicing scene from uh, Batman Begin, uh, from Batman Beyond. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, you know, you just like, oh, I want to be a werewolf. Take a fucking steal a werewolf from a zoo. Take go through a teleporter, come out a fucking steal werewolf. a werewolf from the zoo. I didn't know zoos carry werewolves. I mean, werewolf. steal a wolf from the zoo and just kind of go in, you know, just strip naked 
and pick up the wolf and jump in through a teleporter, come out as a giant scary werewolf. It's a monster making machine. That's what he essentially makes a gene splicer. Yeah. Which is mm -hmm. fucking badass. Anyway, Steve, uh, go ahead, Steve. What was your plot hole that you wanted to point out? Um, this is still pretty minor. I actually thought this was what you were building up to because it made me question the film a bit. Um, so the, the revelation he has is about the flesh and how it ne everything needs to be constructed back using actual flesh rather than the interpretation. If that's true, where are we drawing the line of flesh? Because if it sends organs through perfectly, then it has to realize that organs are encased in a sort of flesh, and everything is sort of encased on every level with a sort of protective flesh. Mm. So, are, are you saying that it knows how to reconstitute the actual flesh only up to a certain point? Or it's not reading what's there because the flesh is the st same thing that your um, well, flesh is the same thing your uh, muscles and stuff's made out of. It's just yeah, tissue. Yeah, that's what I'm right? saying. Like, if it's the case that it can't reconstitute the flesh because it has to get rid of it to read what's inside, then it has to get rid of the 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 walls around the organs to read what's inside the organs, and then again and again and again, and all it would produce is like particles at that point. I guess I see where you're coming from. It's not a major know, issue at all. It, it just it, it doesn't. I up. think there's an argument to be made that it's not really sending the organs through in the correct format. It's it knows that there's some kind of flesh there, but it doesn't know how to put it together. Um, it doesn't know where it goes or how it works. So it's just it's just kind of like sending through everything and then kind of wrapping it all in like just you know this one big thing of flesh and it's inside out or something. Um, um, yeah. Um, again, I don't think either one of our plot holes are like movie breakers at all. They're really just kind of there to get the premise going. Um, but I think they're still worth mentioning there. Yeah, I just I like I didn't notice that till this time watching it, and I did want to mention it because he puts it on a plate, and it's it's one of those annoying things where I just wish they'd they'd, they'd had someone there thinking of continuity and just go, no, 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 no you can't do that. <laughs> Um, because it's like such a big thing when you think about it. Um, um, which I, I do really like the revelation when he figures out a fly got into the tele got into the teleporter. Oh my god, that scene is so good. Yeah. Um, we mentioned Jeff Goldblum, but uh, the other actors in the film also deserve some pretty good note. Um, the woman Ronnie, who, who, who plays her? Um, I don't know. Gina Davis, I think. Mm. Okay, um, sure. Let's go with that. I think it is, because I remember that Jeff Goldblum was married to this woman for a little while, and she was in a movie with him around this time, so I think it's Gina Davis. Um, and she was in Beetlejuice. She, she married him after this? <laughs> I think it might have been, like, during or after this. Yeah, something like that. Um, but yeah, she's really, really good. Um, that final scene when she does shoot him and her reaction to it, the before and after, I, I think all of that's really strong, and it's... It's not the typical horrific crying. There's definitely some real emotion there. Yeah, it's you can tell they had a lot of great chemistry. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. yeah, no wonder they married each other. Yeah. Yeah, like I think the only problem I have with their relationship in the film is she just falls for him way too fast. Well, um, I disagree. It's Jeff Goldblum. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, you got a point. It is Jeff Goldblum. Mm -hmm. <gasps> I don't know. It's it's a um, I don't know, it's it's a little bit of a convenience. Honestly, I don't want him to spend too much time on the romance, but at the same time, it's like, bitch, you just met this dude. Um, yeah, yeah, but it, yeah. yeah, but it's Jeff Goldblum, you know? Sure, bitch, you've met this dude, but it, you've just met Jeff Goldblum. Sorry, you um, lose. I, I think there's definitely some psychological areas to talk about between those two characters. It's just I haven't seen this film enough to really articulate them, so I can't argue for or against their relationship at that point. I don't think it's a major problem. I no, just no. think it happens a little too quickly. No, it's um, fair. Um, it's only 95 minutes long. If we had long, one so. more scene before... If, if we had one more scene before they had sex for the first time, I would have liked it more. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a 95-minute movie, and it does a lot in that time. I guess just certain things aren't as important in the grand scheme. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, because, I mean, it's more important that they have a relationship, not that they, you know, form it really... Um, and they make us buy how much they care about each other and what they do for each other throughout. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Um, 
Was there any other areas we wanted to go to, or...? Um... I'm not sure. I want to go for just a little bit longer. Um... Milan. Yep. Are you there? Yes, I am. Or name something that you wanted to talk about in regards to this movie. Um... I like the... Like, they actually have competency while filming. I mean, mm. you know, Jeff Goldblum, he... Like, the whole... It, it's so seamless, his whole acrobat routine thing. Like, it's... It's it's so... It's so well shot. I mean, he just kind of... His reaction to it is kind of gets up, kind of tries... You know, he's just... It, it's... It's so it's so much like a superhero film. I guess they've taken so much from that kind of you know one scene. There's a lot of that in the Raimi films as well. They kind of even like looking at himself, kind of like trying out the strength and stuff. It's kind of a better Spider-Man origin than Spider-Man in, in the Raimi verse. I mean, the, the way he just kind of tests tests out his powers is so much more realistic than than what Raimi came up with. Go web, go! <laughs> um, yeah, Shazam. I mean, definitely. It, it's, it's. I don't know. I still like Green Lantern. By the power of Grayskull. What the fuck? <laughs> um, the I don't know. Yeah, I guess I could see that. That, like, I'm really curious because you can tell Jeff Goldblum is like really fit when he did this, oh, and yeah. I'm not sure how much of it was a stunt double. Like, obviously the fucking you know flips around the goddamn thing. That's the stunt double. No problem. I believe in that. But, like, when he's doing the thing in the chair, I'm really curious whether or not it's him or a stunt double. Yeah, no. Um, it's, it's a really hard... Milan's right, it is seamless, because it's so hard to tell. Um, this is not, what, Freddy 3? Um, <laughs> with the nunchuck twirling? Or even, or even Nightmare on Elm Street 1 with the fountain of blood from the bed. Oh, I like the Fountain of Blood from the Oh, I, yeah. I do too, but th there's certainly a lack of believability there. Oh, it's a it's dream. It's a dream. It doesn't have to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. I still want to see it. Like, it sounds silly, but I think there is actually so much potential for a Freddy Krueger and Inception crossover film. Uh, um, you that would be uh, so strange. It would be so strange, but there's so much potential there, you have to admit. Oh, I, I admit it. It's just a matter of who would make it and how how long would it take to get to theaters, because I really do want to see something that insane at some point. Uh, yeah, it it would it could be amazing. It could be amazing if it was done right. Um, um, yeah, yeah. And also a Sandman vs. Freddy Krueger comic book. I want that, too. Sandman mm. would kick his ass? Saying. Definitely. He would, but it'd still be awesome. It would totally be awesome, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, we just want—we need to establish the fact that Morbius would kick his ass. So. Oh, oh course, no, I, yeah. I completely agree. Okay. Um, because Steve, Steve like, like Steve, uh, fucking Steve the Claws came out like fucking Mor Mor Morpheus. He'll beat Freddy Krueger. Fuck you. That's all it is. You know what? I just thought of Steve. Yes. Well, we're gonna have to do this at some point. We're gonna have to review Sandman. And you're gonna have to draw Steve as Morpheus because he kind of has the look. Oh, oh definitely. Do I? Yeah. Yeah, well, I just it just hit me as you were saying that. I'm like thinking about Sandman. If you get your hair lightly, like more bushy, I think you could totally sell a Sandman cosplay. Well, it's Definitely. kind of bushy right now that it's kind of growing back. So, dude, um, I actually, you know what? I might actually do a Sandman motion comic somewhere down the line. Uh, shameless plug: I do motion comics on my other channel, the Russian Comic Book Geek channel. Uh, and can I hear your Sandman voice? Um, like, just give me your best Sandman impression ever. I don't think I have one. Make one up on the fly. Come on. Um. <laughs> on the fly. On the fly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, make one up on the fly on the fly podcast. It's great. Yeah. I'm um, clever. Good. What What's something that he says that's awesome? I don't know. Just just a random quote. Just uh, how you make. Just say something vaguely Neil Gaiman y in a, in a Sandman <laughs> voice. <laughs> just say something vaguely genius. <laughs> off the top of your head. Yeah, I do that all the time. Fuck you. Um, Come on. Okay. Uh, I've, yeah. uh, um, Let's see here. Oh, come on. Oh, wait, here we go. What? But where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Say that again? But where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? But where shall wisdom be found, and where is the beginning? 
What? <laughs> I have no idea. Let's <laughs> quote. I, 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 yeah, I should have to read it first. Um, okay, I, I got the wiki page up for Sandman quotes. It is time for me to walk the abyss, time to reclaim my own. I must take the morning star, I do not have high hopes for the meeting. <laughs> I think you could sell it if you worked. I mean, it, yeah, this is just off the cuff, I have no idea what else to do, so... <laughs> it's cool. Um, um, all right, let's go ahead and go to scores. Um, Milan, you start out. Hello, Milan, you there? Oh, oh yes, yes, there we go. Sorry, I forgot to un uh, take away my mic. Anyway, um, I give this five out of five deformed, um, malformed fly monster carcasses. Hmm. Okay, uh, Steve. Yeah, the, that one would be hard to top. Um, I would give it four point five out of five disgustingly ripped arms. Oh God! <laughs> uh, it's disgusting. Okay, I will give this film. Um, should I take off points for the plot holes, Steve? Uh, that's kind of what I did, but I'm only penalizing it because it, it only needed, like, two more minutes in the actual film to make all of that work. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm gonna give it 4.75 <laughs> out of 5 aborted, aborted larvae. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, a lady gives birth to a fucking larvae monster. Yeah, we spent, like, ten minutes talking about it. You were, like, gone, and I don't... Sorry. I don't know why, and, you know... Move. Um, <laughs> oh man! Every time I make a scene, though, it, it just it creates a pit in the stomach. <laughs> yeah. Also, I, I wasn't it... aware we could do four point seven fives or just things in twenty five percentages. Yeah. I said anything on a five scale, Steve. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but honestly, still... I don't believe that scores are entirely necessary. I just think it's like, um, you know. I just think it's fun to do because then we get to try to challenge each other and really see where we're coming, where we think we're coming down. Yeah. Honestly, I don't think of a score until the last minute. Yeah, um, uh, for me, a score is literally if you if you didn't listen to the conversation and you want everything boiled down to the very essence, then here is the score relative to itself. True, Definitely. that's that's fair. Um, I don't know. I just I like scoring things just because it gives a better impression and it it makes a fun little game that we get to play on the show. And I don't think I've ever seen anyone else do this. So. Very true. It, it's fun coming up with things. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I don't know who won this week. Who do, who do you think won, Steve? Um, I kind of liked yours only because it, it reminds me of that scene every time. <laughs> How about you, Milan? Who do you think won? Well, obviously me, because I went the most outlandish. But you know what? Um, that whole scene with the hand breaking, it wasn't that bad. I've seen worse. I've, I've seen worse, you know. Like, okay. I don't know I haven't. Everyone's always like, oh, it's so gross. No, it's not. What, what's wrong with you? You, 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 you? Oh, yeah, we didn't even talk about the whole fucking vomiting on the dude's hand and foot. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and then trying to eat him. That was so, like, was honestly, this is, um, I was talking to a guy at work about it today, and I forgot to mention this, but he goes, so, like, does he go around killing people? And I had to stop and think for a minute, I'm like, no, he doesn't kill anyone in this movie. He fucks people up, but he doesn't kill anyone, except for himself, kind of. Yeah, it's and, true. And a baboon. Um. Well, that just adds a layer of tragedy to the piece anyway, so... Yeah, I think so. Uh, um, I've heard people actually describe this movie as a romantic tragedy, and I think that's that's warranted in, in, for the most part. Okay. Well, anyway, everyone, thank you for listening to our review of The Fly. So, um, guys, here's the thing. We have another week left um, in Horror Movie Month, um, but we've gone through the three of us, and so I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do about another movie topic. I'm not sure, quite sure how to decide this. Um, I guess I'll poll the, the like audience here. Um, what do you, Who that's listening to this call right now has an idea of what, what we should do? I mean, I've been sitting here jerking off, but I have an idea. 
<laughs> Hi, Bill. Hi, Ian. Hi, Steve. Hi, Milan. Hello. Oh my god, he has returned. The prodigal son has returned from the desert. No, I don't oh have returned. I've just spoken up for the first time. I always sit here and jerk off while you guys talk. Well, oh, I yeah, know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, he was don't, criticizing don't us with his dick in ear, evidently. I mean, it's not, not in a gay way. I mean, I watch okay. porn while I'm doing it, but, like, you know, you guys are in my ear, oh. so it's not like you guys are completely absent, so. You, you fucking liar. You so, when I'm not, so when I'm not listening and I jerk off, it's a little bit weird. I get some confusing boners. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm, I'm here, and uh, I have an idea for a movie that uh, that you guys can review next week, and uh, I guess meaning I'll, I'll join as well, because, I mean, I'm going to be there anyway, so I might as well talk. Um. That'd be that'd be ideal. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I might be a little distracted, but you know, I'll, I'll do my best to, to multitask. Uh, but uh, this is actually kind of interesting because Ian texted me about this a while ago, as a matter of fact. And uh, when I told him my choice, he said, "Oh my god, that's so weird!" Because we kind of reviewed the companion piece to this film already uh, pre- previously. So uh, I guess I might as well just say the movie. The movie I chose to review in uh, the Geeky Gentleman Horror Movie Month with you guys is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein from 1994. And it's not just because it was... Ooh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. And believe it or not, I'm not arrogant enough to say that it's it's just because it was made in the year I was born. All right, yeah, I'm arrogant enough to say that, but that's not the reason. Um, uh, But but it's funny because I know you guys already reviewed Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is kind of the reason why this movie got made. So, kind of interesting. Um... Yeah. Of course, uh, this is the Kenneth Branagh version of Frankenstein. Uh, <laughs> w- written, uh, pr- uh, directed, and starring him. So, to want to talk about arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, we'll be talking about that. It's a very, very interesting movie. Uh, I know I have a lot to say about it. I'm sure you guys will as well, because it's a very interesting movie, to say the least. Um, so, uh, that's what we're going to do next week. And I'm going to be back! Woo! Yes! Woo! Finally! Right. Someone that I actually like on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> God damn, Milan's got the teeth tonight. Oh yeah, that's right. I've been oh, it's great. I've I've bought this weird like protein shake from this shady Russian guy, from like, oh, and it's just like I a like, protein gr- shake. I wonder what he means. <laughs> Baby's blood. It, it has it's some weird gypsy magic. I don't know. I wasn't it, thinking it, of the blood. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, anyway. Everyone, everyone, thank you for listening. Uh, so, yeah, next week we'll be doing Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Now, just a quick story before I, before we leave. So, the other day, I was shopping, grocery shopping. I go to the movie section real quick just to look around. You know what I find? A two-pack of Bram Stoker's Dracula <laughs> and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Wow, that is hysterical. Did you buy it? No, because I already... Well, like, here's the thing. I just moved in with Haley, as, all, as everyone knows. Oh, I, <laughs> I already own I already own Bram Stoker's Dracula. She owns Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> so I don't want a third copy of a bad movie. <laughs> um, oh, I didn't listen to your review. You don't like it? No. Wa- listen to the review or at the very least watch the clip I just posted today. Um, okay. the, the link from it. So, I don't love it. I, just, I, just, I think it's an interesting movie though. Yeah, that's kind of why yeah. I came down on it. Um, so everyone... Th- Thanks for listening. This will be exciting. It'll be a lot of fun. And uh, Bill, even though you weren't a part of the episode this week, why don't you go ahead and give us a sign off too? So everyone, thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm the philosopher. I'm the fanatic. I'm... Oh shit! Sorry. God damn it! God damn it! The, the mojo's all off. I know. Yeah, let's start. Off. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like uh, the first time doing a threesome. It's like nobody knows what to do. Um, <laughs> I know, right? Actually, you know, it's weird, you know. The free anyway, anyway. Like, you, do I stick my dick in there? Or do I? Do I mean, it's, weird? can I go with her first time? I mean, is that okay with you? I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to offend you in any way. Mm-hmm, anyway, anyway. So we'll go. Well, here we'll we'll decide more. Me, Bill, Steve, Milan. Okay. So everyone, thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm the philosopher. I'm the fanatic. I'm the politician. And I am obviously forever the madman. And we are your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things. Milan, did you plan that music in there? Because it's fucking perfect. <laughs> uh, my dad, my little brother. Because you're cool.